Hey guys, this is Vince Drummond here with Vince Drummond Golf. Uh, really excited to bring you guys episode 10 of Making the Turn. As you can see, we're in a little bit different setting today. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to Harbor Trees Golf and Beach Club for letting us come out and record our first live Making the Turn podcast episode. We have a really awesome guest for you guys today and Tom Meeks. Uh, during this scene, you guys are going to see some of the things that Harbor Trees has to offer. We're going to kind of scroll through some video of their pro shop, their indoor facility. As Tom mentions in the video, they also have a great gym facility as well uh, and a beach club with a pool. So if you're in the Indianapolis area, in the Hamilton County area, please hit up Harbor Trees. Uh, I'll be sure to link their social medias down in the description box below. But just want to start out by giving a huge shout out to them for letting us be here today. Also want to introduce Tom a little bit. Uh, Tom Meeks was the senior director of competition and rules at the USGA. Uh, he worked at the USGA for over 30 years, ran over 200 championships. He has some really awesome stories with some of the great players in the world, including some pretty funny encounters with Payne Stewart and some other players. Uh, so really excited to get his stories. Also want to be able to give you some more information on the 2019 rules changes in golf. Uh, those are a, a big deal for a lot of people as they start to look into some of the rules changes and some of the things that are going on. And so we're going to look at it specifically from a competitive standpoint and from the competition side of things how those rule changes may affect competitive golf moving forward. So without any further ado, we're going to get it right into it with Tom Meeks. Uh, today we're hats forward, headphones off. Let's go! <laughs> All right, well, I'm here on Making the Turn with our guest today, Tom Meeks. Uh, this is the first episode that we've shot in person, so I'm really excited to be able to bring you guys an episode from the beautiful simulator room at Harbor Trees Golf Club. I uh, really want to give a big shout out to Harbor Trees for letting us record here. Harbor Trees was the course I grew up on, course I grew up playing, and so it's been really exciting for me to have the opportunity to come back here and have such a great guest as Tom. So thanks for joining us today, Tom. My pleasure. Awesome. Uh, so Tom was the former USGA Senior Director of Rules and Competition, um, and he's going to join us today to tell a little bit of his story, some of the fun things that he got a chance to do during his time with the USGA, uh, but also give us the opportunity to learn more about the 2019 Rules of Golf. So, Tom, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story, kind of how you got involved in the game of golf, and then how you wound up working for the USGA? <clears throat> well, I grew up loving golf uh, at a little town in southern Illinois down by Vincennes, and then by the name of Lawrenceville, Illinois. And I started caddying there so I could make uh, a little money and go to uh, uh, have some spending money when I went to YMCA camp for a couple weeks each summer. And uh, uh, back in those days, <laughs> I'm dating myself, of course, back in those days, uh, golf carts weren't on the scene yet. So all, almost all the players used caddies. And believe it or not, this was a nine-hole golf course, and the caddy rate was 75 cents a round. And usually, most of the golfers would give you a 25-cent tip. So a dollar a round, or for 18 holes, two dollars. Isn't that something? Yeah, that's Isn't crazy. that something? Well, uh, from there, uh, I just knew that I wanted to try to do something in golf uh, for my career. And I started out at Butler University in 1958, majoring in pharmacy. Well, it didn't take me long to realize that uh, this was something that I'm not sure I really wanted to do, become a pharmacist. So I got into education and graduated from, from Butler and taught school for seven years in Carmel. Uh, taught and coached uh, basketball, football, and golf there. And ended up uh, doing that for seven years. And then I decided that this is really not one I want to do. So I got into accounting for one year. And again, I knew this wasn't what I wanted to do. I enjoyed accounting, but I just was, I knew I wasn't going to, I didn't want to do this for the rest of my life. And I had a chance to go to work for a company called Kimberly Gitts. And basically that was a company that sold golf carts turf vehicles, and uh, a man by the name of John Kimberly uh, hired me, and uh, I worked for John for about a year, and 
all of a sudden I found out that the Indiana Golf Association and Indiana PGA was uh, going to uh, hold hands and, and uh, start a joint office with an executive director. So I was with John Kimberley and his wife and my wife at a PGA Christmas dance up in Logansport, Indiana, and ran into Mickey Powell, who at the time was the president of the Indiana, Indiana PGA. So uh, my wife and I, Susie and I were out on the dance floor and ran into Mickey and his wife, Kathy, and he said, uh, Tom, uh, uh, we're thinking about this joint office and an executive director, and your name has been mentioned. And uh, he said, uh, when you get a chance, send me a resume. And I said, Mickey, I just happen to have one with me. I kind of got a, a, a little bit of a rumor that I'd run in and they were looking at me as a possible candidate. So I gave him my resume right there. And that position has continued up until even today. Mike David is now the current executive director, but I was the first one and I was hired <clears throat> in January of 1972. And I worked uh, in that position, which basically I did everything. I mean, I kept all the records and set up all the tournaments and just basically did everything. And uh, one day I inquired with the United States Golf Association uh, because I'd had some correspondence with them and a, and a few rules of golf questions. So uh, I inquired as to were, were there any openings or do, do they ever hire anybody for their staff? And at the time, the executive director was a gentleman by the name of P.J. Boatwright. And uh, I went out and interviewed for this, this job. Uh, and I think it might have been, oh, I know what it was, March of, of uh, 1975. And uh, I was there for about two or three days and met everybody and so forth. And they offered me a job. And uh, I said, well, I'm very excited about this p possible position, but I've got to go home and talk this over with my wife. And uh, as I left the golf office that day, uh, P.J. Boatwright uh, said to me, he says, by the way, if you decide to take the job, and I already told him, I said, I'll let you know within a week. He said, that if you decide to take the job, we want to invite you down to Augusta to be at the Masters all week so you can meet all of the executive committee. Now, can you imagine a, a, a small country town by the name of Lawrenceville, Illinois, and a former caddy there and so forth being uh, invited to go to the Masters for the whole week at, at the expenses of the USGA and as their guest? I mean, that's like hanging a carrot out in front of a donkey so they'll go faster. <laughs> So I did, I, I did uh, decide, I told Susie, in fact, she, she at first said uh, her parents were not doing well health-wise, and she said, this is not really a good time for us to, to pursue this job. I said, Susie, this is a, this is one time to, uh, a one-time chance to go to the big leagues, and I may never get it again. So let's think about this real hard. And we finally agreed to give it a go, and that, of course, required us to uh, leave Indiana, which we certainly love and still love, uh, to go to New Jersey for uh, the, the length of this position. And I was first uh, hired as a regional director, which meant basically I was traveling all over the country, visiting golf associations, visiting uh, PGA sections, just visiting anybody and everybody in golf. I was on the road Oh my goodness, uh, probably three out of every four weeks of each month. And uh, I did that for, for several years. And then I had a chance to move up to the rules and competitions department. The, the, what the USJ did, they reorganized their internal positions. And uh, they felt like I would be the best candidate for the rules and competitions department. So. I was moved from the regional affairs work, which was fun, but and it was, I was on the road a lot. And now uh, I'm in charge of the, the rules and competitions department, which is really my biggest love of all the things that the USJ stands for. Uh, this was 
this was my biggest love. So my first uh, U.S. Open was uh, Medina in 1975. I actually started June 1st of 1975, and two weeks later, I'm going to the U.S. Open to, to learn and to help. And, uh, of course, when I got there, uh, Mr. Bowright said, now show up here on Monday morning and uh, bright and early, and we're, we're going to go out and mark the golf course and do all kinds of, you know, I'm, I'm like a, boy in a candy shop right now all this is so exciting for me and here I'm riding in a golf cart with PJ Boatwright who was a big name at the time and was up until the time he passed away but uh, oh we'd be out driving around and he'd see some of the players that he knew and uh, wave at them and then of course we'd come upon Jack Nicklaus on one of the greens and PJ says come on let's go up and say hello to Jack <laughs> which it's just an example of some of the early things that I, I enjoyed doing and was so excited to, to meet Arnold and Jack and, you know, I could go on and on, but uh, that was the start. And uh, from there, uh, well, I ended up, uh, my career with USGA started in June of 75 and I retired 30 years later in 05, September the 30th of 05. So during, during my U.S. Open setups, uh, uh, it, it was very exciting because I'm going out there to try to set up a golf course and challenge the best players in the world from this country and all the uh, international co countries where players come here and play in the U.S. Open. Now, when you try to set up a U.S. Open, uh, you're trying to challenge the best players in the world and you want to make it hard, but you want to make it fair. And that's a hard line to d determine because uh, I'm also responsible for setting the whole locations. And you just don't go out there and just pick a spot, say, put the hole right here for today. Uh, you put a lot of thought into it. And of course, how firm are the greens going to be? Uh, uh, how fast are the greens going to be? So those are, those are things that was they were probably my biggest challenge to set these holes on each of these greens each day, hard, but fair. And, uh, I missed my mark a couple times. I always said that setting up a U.S. Open golf course, uh, you had to, you almost had to get the golf course. So it was almost on its edge. I said, I, I, I always use the comparison of the Indy 500, which I'm a big fan of going to. And, uh, even when we were living in New Jersey for 30 years, we came back every year for the Indy 500. I said, to win the Indy 500, uh, a race car driver has to drive his car on the edge. I mean, very at the very edge. And every now and then, he'll slip and go over the edge. And, of course, he's probably going to be out of the race. Well, setting up a U.S. Open golf course, I, I kind of feel like that's setting up a golf course on the edge. It's just about ready to be too hard. And I made that mistake. On, I'd say uh, a few a few times, the, the 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 one that jumps out at me would have been uh, uh, 1998 at uh, at, uh, at the Olympic Club in San Francisco, and that's the year that uh, I set a I had a back left a whole location uh, on Friday that I knew was going to be tough, but what happened uh, later in that day when I as soon as I got done setting up all the holes, I went over and parked my car close so I could observe how things were going at the 18th hole. This was on the second round Friday. And uh, sure enough, uh, a couple of players had balls go up to the hole and then go back down from where the hole is. You never want that to happen. You, you, you don't want uh, a golf course, a hole to be set up that, Someone's going to putt up to it, and then it's, the ball's going to roll back. That, that was a mistake on my part. And the two players that it affected most were Tom Lehman and Payne Stewart. Uh, and uh, there was a, a big to-do made about it. And uh, to be honest with you, I went back to my room that night. I was supposed to have dinner with some friends, and I went back, and I said, I'm just going to order room service and get a, a bottle of red wine and just stay in my room and, and maybe I'll go to bed tonight and think, 
this is a bad dream. This didn't happen. Well, I woke up Saturday morning, and it did happen. I know that it happened. So all I can say, you know, I could throw in the town and say, that's enough. I'm, I can't do this. I can't take it. So I'll turn this over to somebody else. But I didn't. I said it was my fault. It was a, it was a mistake. Well, the 1999 U.S. Open uh, was at Pinehurst, and uh, of course, I'm still thinking about what happened in 1999 and uh, 98 at, at uh, Olympic. So I do run into uh, Tom Lehman uh, on Wednesday. I was out and giving the golf course a final check, and I said, uh, "Tom, uh, good luck this week. Are you playing okay?" And he, he said, yes, I, I could win this week. And I said, well, I hope I don't make any mistakes like I did last year. He said, he looked at me, he said, don't be gun shy, which was a nice way to tell me to continue to do my job and don't let the mistake that happened the previous year, don't let it affect how I continue to do my job. And then also earlier in the week, I ran into Payne Stewart, who was the other person that was affected the, the most by the 98 whole location at uh, the 18th of the Olympic. And uh, he said, I don't like the way you set up number 16. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. I, he said, you know, the members play that as a par five, and you've got to play in around, uh, well, as a par four, around 480. And I said, that's correct. I could have gone back to maybe another 15 or 20 yards and played it as a par four from there or as a par five, but I decided to play it up a little bit and play it as a par four. He said, well, that green's not designed for a long, long shot in there. And uh, that's what that's what we have to do because of being a par four. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do, Payne. I'll, I'll set it up as a par five and move it all the tee markers all the way back to the very back tee. If you promise me that you and all the other players in this field will not go for the green in two because it's not designed for a long, the green's not designed for a long iron, you just said. And he looked at me and said, you're impossible and walked away from it. But uh, as, as, the, as the Open continued at Piners, the last day, it's a battle between Phil Mickelson and Payne Stewart. And Payne uh, makes a very nice putt on the last hole to win by one. After Payne sinks his putt, and uh, now he has to go sign his scorecard and turn it in and make sure it's right because uh, there's been some tragedies that could happen with a scorecard situation. You don't want to make any mistakes, that's for sure. So I went down to the to where the scorecard were being turned into, which, which is a, a room underneath the clubhouse. And I waited, and there were a lot of people outside, the media, his wife was there, everybody. So when Payne came out of the room, uh, finished with his scorecard, he sees me, and he grabs me, and takes me into the, the room through these two uh, uh, doors uh, that open uh, takes me in to, to uh, be just he and I alone. And he grabs me and he uh, em embraces me and he says, you set up one hell of a golf course, which was probably the ni nicest thing I ever uh, heard from anybody uh, over my career with USJ. And it meant a lot to me. And uh, then, of course, Payne had his... Uh, plane crash that was a tragedy, and uh, we never really got a chance to uh, to spend any time together after that. Vince, I, that, that's just a few of the stories. I I made one mistake when I started with USG. I should have I should have kept a diary. My wife has, has told me that many times that I should I should be writing a book or I should have had a book completed, but I, but I didn't do that. So. 30 years with the USGA, obviously you got a chance to, to run a lot of different championships. Um, what were, do you know how many championships you were able to, to kind of be a part of during your time? Well over 200. I, I wrote it down one day, uh, just sitting there with all the championships that I ran. I, the toughest one for me to, to run, to be honest with you, was the senior women's amateur. It was tough because, uh, well, you know, seniors, uh, they have they have different uh, needs and styles than, than uh, the younger people do, but uh, I enjoyed doing it. And and speaking of the senior uh, women's championship, uh, I ran several, which Alice Dye won. And uh, she just passed away here last week, so uh, bless her heart. She was a, she was a real winner and, and really, really a fine lady. 
uh, to, to know. Yeah, definitely. And especially here at, at Harbor Trees, Pete and Alice were a big part of, of the community. And obviously with Pete designing the course, it was very sad to hear of that. Um, talk to me a little bit about some of the, the things that you did. We talked about it a little bit with Payne and maybe 1998, but trying to deal with some of that criticism. Um, obviously, a lot of times at the U.S. Open, like you said, you're kind of fighting that line between a golf course being difficult and fair and a golf course maybe going over the edge. So talk a little bit about dealing with that criticism, whether it's from players or caddies or the media. Well, I, I've got to say this about the players. For the most part, the players I had to deal with were couldn't have been nicer, couldn't have been more gentlemen. Uh, there, there was always one or two. And I certainly don't want to mention any names, but there are always one or two that was that that was going to complain no matter what you did. You know, it's uh, they knew I set the holes, so I can honestly tell you that not often did I have very many of them come up to me after a round and say, "You really had some nice holes out there today." If anything, uh, there would be criticism, and that didn't happen very often. They knew, they knew they were going to be harder. Uh, generally, we. We would, uh, we would always set the hole within usually four or five paces from the edge of a green, whether it be front, back, left, or right. That you, you, When you set holes, you want to balance it out, have as many fronts as you do backs and as many rights as you do left. So you try to balance it out and still yet keep it, keep it as, as, as hard as you can, but still fair. That was the kind of the key. All right, so let's get into some of the new stuff with the 2019 rules changes. Obviously, that's a, a pretty big deal, a pretty big shakeup to the rules of golf and kind of the way that, that golf's going to be played moving forward. Uh, so talk a little bit just about your thoughts on some of the 2019 changes, kind of if you know why the USGA moved to make some of these changes, just a little bit about what, what they are, I guess, and, and why the USGA is moving towards that. Well, first of all... Uh... I did a little research on you, and I found out that uh, you're a very good. I know your dad's a good player, but uh, you're even a better player. And uh, as a result, I'm going to give you a, one of the uh, new books that, that's out. Thank so you, you so much. I appreciate now, it. Now you're a coach and a good player, <laughs> so you got to know that stuff. Yeah. You know? And it's uh, it's up to you. To, if you don't know, say I don't know, but I, let me look it up, and I'll I'll do my best to find out the answer. And if I can't find it. I'll call Tom Meeks and uh, <laughs> have him give it to me. Uh, well, you know, we've watched a few events already this year under the new rules because they became effective January 1 of 2019. Now, the one that I uh, am, am very curious about is leaving the flag stick in while you putt on the putting green. In the past, you could leave it in if you were off the green, and you could leave it in if you putted on the green, but if you struck the flag stick, from a, a stroke that was made on the putting green, it was a penalty, not now. And I've noticed that, uh, uh, well, I've noticed uh, Bryson DeChambeau's using it, uh, uh, at least most of the time, and uh, Adam Scott's using it. Yep. So I think a lot of the players are going to use it uh, for strokes on the putting green until someone has like a three-footer and puts it, and it looks like it's going in, but it hits the flag stick and kicks out. <laughs> then, then there's going to be some curiosity by all the players. I think a lot of these players now, I would be surprised if they're not practicing from all different angles with the flag stick in and then with it out. And they're going to form their own conclusion about it. But the nice thing is they can have that real long putt, like an 80 or 90 footer, that's, they're just trying to get it close. If it would go in, that's great, but they want to get it close so they can two putt. I think in most cases, you're going to see them leave the flag stick in there. Now, what bothers me a little bit, like here at Harbor Trees, uh, I'm, I'm playing with a group here on Wednesday, for example. And there's four players in the group. Well, player A wants it in and puts it, and he leaves it in. Now, player B, who's it's his turn to putt, he wants it out. And then he, he does his thing, and then player C wants it back in. See, that's where I think it's going to be a little bit of a nuisance. Two pe people want it in and two people want it out. But I think for the most part, I think golfers are going to enjoy leaving the flags they can. The drop rule. Now, this is one, uh, one rule that I've tried to talk to the USGA about and, and get them to at least consider changing it. 
The rule says now you have to drop it at knee high. <clears throat> well, I know for a fact that some players have a very hard time getting down to drop the ball at knee high. Mm -hmm. And uh, that shouldn't happen. See, what I wanted them to do was to say, drop the ball at knee height or higher. Knee height or higher. That takes care of everybody. But uh, for some reason, they wanted it knee height. Now, let's see what happens because it'll be in there for at least the four years. I don't think they'll consider making any changes in any of these rules for the four-year period that it's supposed to go. Uh, another one that people, I think this is a good one, is the uh, looking for a lost ball. And the, the rule forever has been five minutes. So three minutes is certainly uh, going to help speed up play a little bit. The key to, to, to a lost ball uh, for the viewing audience is play a provisional ball when you think your ball might be lost outside of a water hazard or out of bounds. Uh, play a provisional ball. But the, the thing about a provisional ball is you have to announce it when you do it. In other words, if I hit a ball that looks like it could be lost in the high grass uh, or out of bounds, I'm, I can announce at that point I'm going to play a, a provisional ball and I can play another provisional ball right from where that I last played from. I'd like to see that done more often, but you have to announce it. People just can't say, well, that might be a goner. I'm going to reload. That, that's not good enough. You have to say provisional ball. The one, uh, the one rule that uh, I know... Most everybody are they're gonna like this rule where they can tap down any damage that's on their line of putt, spike marks or anything else. They're gonna be able to tap it down. Now, that that rule has been in there forever. Excuse me to prohibit that, and now they can do it. Now, the one thing that the rules were were supposed to help this year, the changes, all the changes was supposed to help with pace of play. Now, I can tell you right now, if you're going to allow everybody to go down their line and tap down anything that's on their line of putt, that's not going to help pace of play. It's just going to take more time. Definitely. But I think overall, I think overall, and my boss, P.J. Boatwright, and his boss, Joe Dye, I think they are probably turning over in their graves with some of these rules <laughs> because they, they were the author of the rules that have now been changed. Gotcha. So I think that's... But overall, I, I think uh, the golfers are going to like them, and uh, we'll see. Yeah, so uh, kind of like what you said, controversy or not, you think it'll be four years before any of these get oh, yeah. changed, so yes, they'll, be, they'll be they, in place. They, they just can't have an instantaneous reaction and say, oh, we should have let them drop it knee high or higher. They, they can't just change right now. They, they, they've got to stick it out for a four-year period. Give it a, give it a fair chance to see if it's going to work okay or not. All right, so now uh, one last question for you. You talked about it a little bit with your foursome, but uh, are you going to putt with the flag stick in or the flag stick out? Have you decided yet? <laughs> I haven't even thought about it. <laughs> uh, I probably will. I probably will. Uh, well, I will until I miss the, <laughs> until I have a three-footer that might uh, have been a skin for me out here in the Gary Melby group. Uh, if I have a three footer that would have got me skin and it hits a flag stick and kicks out, then, then I'll probably take it out. But, uh, for the most part, I'll, I'm probably going to leave it in. Yeah, definitely. I think um, even for, for me as a college coach, we had one of our first events in 2019 recently, and it was basically on every hole you're asking kids if they want the pin in or out, which is different for sure. Normally you just pull it, and then every time a kid drops, you have to, to double check. Did you drop that from your knee or did you drop it from your shoulder? Yeah. Um, and yeah. so it's been interesting, but it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we get to a part of the show now that we like to do just for a little bit more fun. It's kind of a, a rapid-fire question round. Uh, we call it the Twilight Nine, so it's similar to playing nine holes on a summer's evening trying to beat the sun. So we're going to go nine questions, rapid-fire I uh, just want you to, to say first thing that pops into your head. Okay. okay. All yeah. right. Sure. Uh, lowest round of golf? Uh, 63. Awesome. Uh, favorite pre-round meal? Uh, pre-round? Probably, uh, I don't know, probably, probably a cheese sandwich. <laughs> uh, favorite on-course snack? These little cheesy crackers they have here at the break at Harper Tree. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite pump-up song? 
what type of music do you listen to to, to get yourself excited or if you're looking to get in a good mood? My favorite group is ABBA, and my favorite male singers, Frank Sinatra and Michael Bublé. And then, do you, what is your hardest or least favorite exercise in the gym? Uh, we talk about a lot of fitness on here, so what's one thing you really hate doing? <laughs> the epileptic. <laughs> in fact, I just worked out this morning. Harbor Trees has a wonderful workout area over here. And uh, after my open heart surgery in October, I did my, uh, my uh, rehab over here at the hospital workout center. And once that was over, then I, I'm on my own, and I've been working out here at the Harbor Trees, and it's, they've got a very nice uh, workout area. Definitely. Uh, so you get to the course, and you only have five minutes to warm up before your tea time. What do you do? What's the priority for you before you get started? Putting. Putting. Uh, and then what's your golf brand of choice? What's my what now? Golf brand of choice. What's your favorite golf brand? Well, uh, I've always been a Titus man. Okay. Uh, what's the best movie of all time? Doesn't have to be a golf movie, but it can be. Mm. Shane. Okay. And then what? In case is, anybody doesn't know what Shane is, it that was a movie with Alan Ladd. It's a great movie, great movie, and that's always been my favorite. And then what's your favorite sports team? St. Louis Cardinals, baseball. Obviously the Colts and football. I like the Celtics and basketball. I like the Pacers too, and my. Of course, my loyalty is to my famous Butler Bulldogs. Awesome. Uh, that's our Twilight Nine, a little segment we like to do here on the show in order to kind of get to know our guests a little bit better. Real quick, before we let you go, I uh, just want to ask a few more questions just to kind of hammer the point home for the listeners here. Um, for you personally, what's your best memory from the game of golf? What's the best experience that, that you've had as a result of this game? Well, I... I, I th- it's just a satisfaction to go out and play golf and know that whatever the result is, it's strictly on you. And then what's your number one piece of advice for competitive players as they head into the 2019 season? With all the rule changes and everything, as, as players start to get ready for tournament golf, what piece of advice would you give them based off of your experience? Well, first of all, golf can lead anybody to some very special things. Very special people, very special uh, 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 accomplishments and so forth. Very special. But one thing I want to remind all golfers, when you're out playing a round of golf, you're representing your family, you're representing your church, you're representing so many different things. So the most important thing for you to do is to conduct yourself in an appropriate way while you're on the golf course. Just remember one thing. You're not going to make every putt that you have. You're, you're going to miss a, a short one somewhere down the road. A two-footer, you're going to miss it. So make sure you get yourself out. Because it's over. I mean, you missed it. You, there's nothing you can do now to change that myth. Concentrate and try to never let it happen again. But that is behind you. But nothing upsets me more than to take a golfer, to see a golfer on a golf course, uh, conducting himself in a manner that's not acceptable. And I can tell you this, um, I'm sure a lot of my former juniors that I did with the USJ Junior, I took many of them aside, many of them aside, and I said, young man, one more incident like that, and I will pick you up in my car, and I will call your parents and tell them that you're on your way home. So make sure you conduct yourself in a manner that your parents will be proud of you, your community, and anybody else that should be. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate it. It was great to be able to have you on the podcast, to be able to get to to hear some of your stories and to hear some of the things that that you have to say about the 2019 rules. I really appreciate you giving me the book and and taking the time to meet with us today. Well, I... Thank you, Vince, but I can also tell you I enjoy doing things like this. Well, that was episode 10 of Making the Turn with guest Tom Meeks. Once again, I want to give a huge shout out to Tom for coming on to the podcast. really want to thank him for a lot of his great stories. Uh, his stories and interactions with Payne Stewart were very heartfelt and very entertaining. I also want to give him a very big thank you for giving me a copy of the book for the new rules of golf. Uh, that really meant a lot to me. He signed the inside, and so being able to, to get that from somebody like Tom was really, really cool. 
Also want to say thank you so much to Harbor Trees and all of their staff here uh, on the golf side of things, Justin, Riley, and Brenna. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to come back to this place and be able to show you guys off a little bit, but also be able to have the really cool experience of recording my first podcast episode live, uh, standing here in the golf simulator and practice area, uh, which is an amazing indoor facility. So if you're somebody who is looking for a place to call home, a place to play golf and be able to practice during the winter, make sure that you check out Harbor Trees in Noblesville. Uh, it's a great place. It's where I grew up playing all my life. I uh, just want to once again thank them for allowing me to record here in person. It was a really awesome experience and can't wait for you guys to be able to enjoy episode 10 of Making the Turn. want to give you guys a huge shout out for your continued support of the channel, for continuing to support me and the things that I'm trying to do. Uh, really excited for some of the fitness series, the golfer in the gyms videos that we have going on now. Uh, really excited for, for that content coming to you guys. Making the Turn is getting close to becoming a full audio podcast as well, which is super exciting. Uh, about two episodes away from making that transition to where we'll have all episodes going live on YouTube and on audio platforms at the same time. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Hit that subscribe button if you're new. If you want to continue to see fitness videos, if you want to continue to see podcast videos, also share the channel with some people that you may know. Huge shout out to all the Harbor Trees members that are watching this episode. Hopefully I did a good job of, of showing off your facility and showing off Harbor Trees. Can't wait to see some of you guys this summer. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for stopping by. And this is Vince Drum and Golf, and I'm out.